Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Alexander Rosenthal from the Petrarch Institute, joining you once again. Here I am with my good friend and colleague, Dr. Miles Smith. Um, there's, uh, we got, uh, I think, a very interesting topic today, which is the gentleman in uh, in the Renaissance. But first, I want to tell you, um, we we want to tell you a few things. Um, let's start with the courses that we are offering starting October 16th. Miles, you want to tell the audience a little bit about our classes? Absolutely. We're First of all, we're delighted to have you with us for this uh, promo video about the gentleman, but we're also pretty excited to tell you about the uh, start of our fall season. Uh, we've now got three courses running simultaneously. Alex, correct me the moment I say something that's not right, but um, we're, we're very pleased to be running our, our course uh, comparing Nietzsche and Socrates, these sort of fundamental alternatives in uh, the approach to reality and the world. Uh, we've got our course on virtues and uh, classical philosophy, so really taking it back to the foundation of character. And, and somewhat similar, we've got a third course. Um, we're, we're glad to be bringing back our course on classical rhetoric. And uh, Alex, if they're interested in uh, any of those courses, uh, how would they express interest? Easiest way is just to email me. So on this video itself, I've left my Petrarch email and you can just contact me if you're interested. The other thing I wanna say is we've been discussing the idea of running this course on the gentleman as, as a full Petrarch course, because I'm finding that there's a lot of interest in the idea of the gentleman and manners and etiquette in um, general culture. And I was thinking that it might be of interest to people. So if you are interested in our um, uh, topic today, uh, let us know in the comments section. Uh, and you can help with your input as well in things that you might be interested in related to this topic. You may help help us uh, sort of uh, develop and form the, the course. Um, did you have any other thoughts on that, Miles? Yeah, I mean, we'd really like to hear um, what would uh, what would make for an ideal course for you. I mean, we know that there is, on the one hand, almost a kind of social anxiety about the loss of manners or uncertainty around manners. It's almost as if um, having strong manners helps people deal with anomie or, you know, the uncertainty of how to navigate social situations and uncertainties in life. So there's a great interest in the topic. There are modern day uh, touchstones from Miss Manners, who, you know, goes back some time. And I know nowadays, latterly, Art of Manliness blog, uh, which really covers everything from, from you know, sturdiness to character to manners. Uh, these things have a lot of traffic, a lot of interest. And we thought it would be interesting uh, to have a course which talked about one of the classical roots of all that, which is the, the Renaissance gentleman. Um, and what I took from you, uh, Alex, earlier is in terms of approaching this video today, um, we're talking about something which emerges in the early modern day. So uh, did you want to introdu introduce the idea of the, uh, the courtly gentleman is and, and how, for example, it, it represents a change or an evolution from uh, the medieval idea of chivalry? Uh, yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, one thing that I think we can think about is the notion that of human types or human ideals. It seems pretty much every age has its own ideal types, right? So if we think about the Middle Ages, right, almost every story and every film ever made about the Middle Ages will have these two types of the monk or and the knight, right, as sort of the ideals of the Middle Ages. Or some of them, like, if, for example, Star Wars will kind of combine them. If you notice the Jedi monks, the Jedi, uh, the Jedi knights have sort of elements of the monastic and elements of the knightly. So these are sort of archetypical uh, types. And what I would argue is that the type of the gentleman uh, it is the type which the Renaissance, uh, which we could consider either late medieval or early modern or simply transitional between the two, uh, which is the type which it introduced. Uh, and it's one which uh, dominated the imagination, certainly of Europe and European courts originally, uh, for the next five centuries, but also one which filtered down later on, like 18th and 19th centuries, uh, as people, um, you know, uh, rising, rising social classes, 
uh, beco uh, uh, saw becoming a gentleman through schooling and uh, education and manners as one um, uh, in, as the most central element, really, of upward no, uh, mobility. And we could say that the gentlemanly ideal certainly continued um, through the 19th century into the tw 20th century. And it still, to this day, uh, still has lots of impacts on our culture today. If we think about, uh, you had mentioned etiquette, as well as elements of education, which survive uh, even, even to our uh, uh, time. Uh, just to give you a sense of the long-term impact and influence and importance that the gentleman ideal was seen to have in European culture, let's take a look at uh, uh, this passage from Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France was, uh, might be helpful. He says, nothing is more certain than that our manners, our civilization, and all the good things which are connected with manners and with civilization have in this European world of ours, depended for ages upon two principles and were indeed the result of both combined. I mean, the spirit of the gentleman and the spirit of religion. So we could see that we could see he really sees, uh, Burke really sees this gentleman ideal as one of the pillars upon which all of civilization rests. And if you read that book, I mean, I found at least 25 citations of the term manners in his texts. So this whole, we sometimes underestimate maybe the whole idea of manners, but uh, he really thinks that the decline of manners is one of the things which is in his mind throwing modern civilization into a state of uh, confusion and chaos at the, very <laughs> at the very best. Whether we agree with his analysis or not, it gives you some sense of the importance of the gentleman uh, ideal. So I thought with that, uh, I would, turn to uh, what are the essential elements of this gentleman I uh, ideal, which we could say maybe starts to ar arise in the late 14th century and certainly the 15th century uh, onwards. What are the differences and what are the, what does it mean? What Basically, what is it? Uh, so shall I go ahead with that, Moss? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, well, the first thing to say is how did it differ from the from the medieval uh, idea? I mean, the term gentleman in the Middle Ages really signified, I would say, two things uh, significant. One is it was essentially a status, right? Like the gentleman, right? The, the gentleman was essentially, if you came from a family, let's say, which had the right to bear arms, right? Uh, one is, was born into the gentleman uh, uh, status. That was sort of the medieval idea. And what was the principal occupation of sort of the aristocratic and gentle classes was military, right? So when you thought of a gentleman in the Middle Ages, in the late Middle Ages, what you thought of was basically a kind of soldier, uh, the knight, uh, uh, you know, someone uh, gifted in, in arms. This, now, so what we could talk, think about in terms of the beginning of the Renaissance ideal is that is a transformation, particularly within European aristocratic culture, of what it means to be a gentleman, right? You, you begin to get an ideal formed much more around uh, manners and education rather than simply skill in arms. Um, this was called in the Renaissance the the the, the Luomo Universale, the universal man, right? It's not sufficient simply to be a soldier. So um, uh, J.H. Plum, who wrote this book on the Italian Renaissance, I think puts it quite well. Uh, what was this ideal of the universal man? Uh, so he says, um, what had been private became public, and a study of the classical heritage became a necessity for a gentleman. Indeed, his familiarity with the classics was the hallmark of civility. A man might be a warrior, a priest, a merchant with a professional outlook, with professional mores. Yet, if he wished to be regarded as a complete man, uomo universale, more was it, that's universal man, more was expected of him. He needed to be well bred, and the breeding of the gentleman was defined by the Italians of the Renaissance. They insisted on a refinement of taste, an ease of manner, combined with a capacity for manly pursuits. 
a knowledge of the classics, an acquaintance with history and philosophy, an appreciation of music, painting, architecture, and sculpture, connoisseurship of the rare and beautiful, whether they might be books, jewels, coins, or scraps of antiquity. All these interests were to be lightly born without pedantry or excessive professionalism. This was the image that Castiglione created in his famous book, The Courtier, which we'll discuss a little bit. Um, we'll discuss a little bit in a, in a moment. Okay, so the other thing uh, about um, the um, the other thing about the uh, gentleman, it, I would say, would be this idea of what well, we could say aesthetic uh, self fashioning, right? We could say that there's a, well, th there's a lot of themes uh, in during the the Renaissance, uh, which relate to this kind of idea of the individual, right? We discussed that in past videos with Burkhart and the idea of the individual uh, fashioning uh, themselves and himself. And, and so, um, uh, here was a comment by Dawson, which I thought was kind of uh, significant. He says, such universal men as Leon Battista Alberti, at once athlete and scholar, architect and poet, artist and scientist, were a characteristic product of 15th century Italy. And it was this, uh, and it was this many sided excellence, which took the place of the medieval ideals of chivalry as the model of the European gentleman and courtier in the following way. Life was conceived not in the medieval way as a struggle and a pilgrimage, but as a fine art in which no opportunity for knowledge and enjoyment is to be uh, neglected, right? So it relates a little bit to a shift. First of all, we could say the medieval ideal was essentially theological, right? And focused on the clergy and monastic orders. Uh, we could say the gentleman ideal was more of a lay uh, you know, more more relevant, let's say, to the to the laity and this idea of life as a fine art rather than simply a pilgrimage to the next world, uh, I think, is kind of important in uh, in it. To this day, in Italy, they talk about la bella figura, right? Presenting oneself, one's presentation uh, to the world, the social virtues, um, taste, manners, dress, clothing, graceful carriage and speech, deportment. Right, all of these things enter into sort of the social image uh, that was considered important to cultivate. Uh, now, another element would be education, right? And uh, here, which the, here, this was the idea of the vir virtutis, that is in Latin, right? The virtuous man, right? Uh, and so. Um, the idea was that the gentleman had to be educated, right? Which was not such a priority for the noble classes in the in the Middle Ages. Uh, so what we hear from Cardinal Sadaletto, one of the great Renaissance humanists, uh, he 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 explains why uh, study is so important. He says we receive from nature what is central in ourselves, what indeed makes us truly and individually what we are but in a rough and unfinished form. It is the function of letters to bring this to its highest perfection and to work out in it a beauty comparable to the divine uh, original. So the idea here is that um, education, letters are necessary to bring human nature to its full beauty and uh, perfection, right? To this exemplar, which the gentleman is meant to embody. And what's the root to it? It is essentially the study of the classics, right? So in certain respects, the, the um, gentleman ideal is also a revival of Greek and Roman ideals, right? Uh, going back, let's say, to Greece, the idea of the kalos kagathos, which means the beautiful and the good, right? So the gentleman should be both, as we saw in this idea of aesthetic uh, self self-fashioning, uh, he sh should be both beautiful and graceful, right? As it were, in all that uh, in all that he does, right? And achieve excellence in in a wide range of fields, right? To give sort of an excellence to his character, uh, but at the same time, he must be morally virtuous, right? Kalos and Kagata.
right? Beauty and uh, virtue. Uh, and uh, going hand in hand with this, right, just as the Middle Ages gave rise to the university and scholasticism, which was essentially, or began at least, as pre-professional training for the clergy, essentially, right? Uh, who, you know, whether theologian or in canon law or uh, uh, in the in these kinds of faculties right was that you were essentially it was essentially a form of a professional training what you have in the renaissance is the rise of the renaissance uh court school which i'm i'll probably which i'll discuss a little bit more in a moment which is the distinguishing institution uh we could say for for the training of this ideal and the last thing is about uh, manners, right? Manners assume uh, a tremendous importance uh, during the uh, Renaissance. Um, well, to some degree, manners uh, relate to things people think about, like table manners. For example, the fork first ar arose in Renaissance Italy. Actually, it first arose in the Byzantine Empire, but it became widely common in Western Europe, in Renaissance Italy, and then gradually spread uh, over the centuries, actually, <laughs> to the rest of uh, of Europe. So some of it is things like table manners and things like this, but there's much more important principles behind manners uh, that I would want to discuss. And we'll look a little bit at Della Casa's uh, book on manners, which was one of the first and most important and influential books uh, on the topic. So what I was thinking of doing was uh, discussing a little bit about uh, the Renaissance courts and court schools, one. Uh, secondly, uh, looking a little bit at Castiglione's book and its importance and influence and why it had such, a, such an impact. And then uh, to discuss a little bit uh, De La Casa's book on manners. So that was sort of my, my thinking. Did you have any thoughts or comments, Miles? Well, I guess I have one quick sidebar and one question. So the sidebar would be you just made a quick reference to uh, the influence of the old Byzantine Empire on Italian culture uh, going out of the Middle Ages. And so if people are interested in that, they can certainly check out our two YouTube videos, uh, really uh, parsing quite uh, compactly uh, the history and culture and civilization of Byzantium. And also a question about this ideal type. So as we go from the characteristic of the gentleman to the history that brought this ideal about, you talked about the knight and monk model in the Middle Ages. In both cases, um, the militarization angle versus civilization, there's this idea, I guess, that the knight is often the knight errant, right? I mean, far ranging, on campaign. Um, the monk is removed from the city, right? You think about the ideal of Benedict leaving Rome to go out of the city and to retreat to form an order or a rule. Is there an element of commerce and the developing city as being part of this urbane uh, ideal, you know, or, or the gentleman in, in that kind of changing social context? Is that an important factor? Yeah, completely, right? So this is something Dawson uh, hits on quite a bit is this idea that you have a new kind of civilization in Italy, a new old kind of civilization. What was the civilization of the ancient world? It was primarily the world of the city, right? The world of the city states, the polis of Greece and, uh, and Rome and so forth, right? Uh, the Roman Republic and so forth. And so the virtues in that kind of world were these public virtues particularly, right? Uh, and rhetoric was an immediately practicable uh, sort of thing. Um, in the Middle Ages, following the fall of the Roman Empire, you had the uh, agrarianism, right, uh, became overwhelmingly uh, dominant. But in Italy, um, you have the reemergence of the city, the city-state, in fact, in Florence and Venice and these places. And uh, yes, also um, uh, new wealth is pouring in. Uh, and so there's a new emphasis on the social virtues, right? And on, for example, the study of rhetoric, uh, again, has practical importance as you have the rise of republics in places like, uh, um, in places like Florence and so forth, right? The Florentine Republic and so forth. So completely, yes. And, and we're getting, and I think this is also very important. 
we're getting the end of feudalism in Italy. In Italy, in, so in, in the rest of Europe, you, uh, you would have knights who would have fealty to a lord, right? Uh, in general. And, um, and so when you needed to wage war, the feudal system was that, you know, the knight gets a certain amount of land or the vassal gets a certain amount of land and he raises an army for the lord, right? But in Italy, that system kind of broke down. Feudalism had already largely broke down. And so you would get uh, mercenaries called the condottieri. And I, so I think one of the elements here is, so what is the role of the aristocracy? So you can, <laughs> right? Uh, and so you have a transformation of the aristocracy from a purely military caste to what it becomes throughout the history, the next few centuries of Europe, a, a class which is also, or even principally about the patronage of culture, right? About, about, you know, about a whole bunch of, about the patronage of the arts and letters and so forth. Uh, and what's interesting is even though Italy was such an urban civilization, this gentleman ideal, as we'll see, became extremely uh, transportable to the court cultures that were emerging in the rest of Europe, right? So that's an important thing, I think. The courtier, uh, the rhetor as such, like the Florentine rhetor, doesn't have much usage in the Holy Roman Empire or in England or France at the time because you were had kings, right? Uh, basically, right? Um, uh, at least not immediately. I mean, there were developments, but but the courtier, the person who can prevail upon the king <laughs> because he's uh, uh, such a charismatic figure does, right? And so this idea of the courtier is highly exportable to both forms of polity. So does that help at all? Yes, indeed. Um, so, um, yeah, so let's discuss first the Renaissance uh, court school. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we discussed a little bit on the Byzantine uh, Empire. Uh, and um, uh, so what you start getting uh, there are figures like uh, Guarino de Verona and um, uh, Vittorino da Feltre, right, who start founding these schools which are meant to transmit this new, um, this new uh, ideal of humanism, right? And uh, so what are, so basically they're going to focus on the classics, on liberal uh, studies, on the Greek and Roman classics, on um and as uh, um on, on on both arts and letters right so these two things are sort of both uh, conceived of as being the um the basis of the gentlemanly ideal right so in his work pierre pietro vergerio uh writes that um for among the studies and liberal arts of mankind are two in particular that have the greatest affinity with cultivating virtue and obtaining glory, namely instruction in letters and uh, arms, right? So these are sort of the practices, these are sort of the two things which are the foundation. Uh, and uh, he gives a, a, a special importance uh, to uh, liberal arts as being the things which develop character, right? Uh, so uh, Pierre Pietro Vergerio says, for everyone acquires for himself the liberal arts and virtue, uh, virtue itself, and these are the most desirable things a person can seek. For wealth, glory, and pleasures, these are transitory and fleeting. Character, however, and the fruits of the virtues endure undiminished and last uh, forever, right? So the reason why the liberal arts are so highly prized uh, is because uh, they're seen to be the instrument through which character uh, is developed. Um, now, uh, what, was the, what were the studies, right? So you have the revival, like we said, of the Greek and Roman classics, right, which included poetry, rhetoric, history of philosophy. There was also, like I said, uh, the development of skill in arms, right? And as well as physical sports, which were things like wrestling, javelin, running, uh, 
uh, grooming and dress. Um, and, uh, and another, and, and also we should not uh, uh, forget that religion was also an important uh, part of the Renaissance schooling. So um, Dawson writes, it must be emphasized that the goal of humanist education was in no sense a revival of paganism. For all the Renaissance writers on education from Peter Paul Vergario's treatise, De Ingenuis Moribus, to Cardinal Sadoletto's work, De Libris Recte Instituendus in 1531, entirely accept the traditional Christian view of the place of religion in education. Liberal education was the education of a Christian gentleman or citizen and in no way rejected the supremacy of Christian ethics and theology. The great humanist educators like Leonardo Bruni, Guarino of Verona, Vittorino de Feltre, and Vergario were themselves devout Christians who wished to unite the intellectual and aesthetic culture of Hellenism with the spiritual ideals of Christianity, right? So these are sort of the two foundations. And so, you know, daily mass as well, uh, and uh, and and uh, uh, the precepts of the Christian faith were also part of um, these schools. Now, who went to these schools? Um, well, two. There, there, there's something to say, right? So, on the one hand, many of them would be the children of nobles, right, who were being prepared for their ruling uh, um, for their ruling role in society. Uh, but it is also worth uh, mentioning that. Um, Vittorina da Feltri, whose, whose school was called La Casa Giacosa, right, the, the joyful house, because uh, students were so apparently so happy there. <laughs> um, uh, he took poor students free of charge if they displayed talent, right? So uh, it was not, uh, it was not strictly, so, so this, this was kind of a, an issue that arose in the Renaissance, the idea of vere nobilitate, what does it mean to have true uh, nobility? Uh, it, it did not. Uh, it, it did not always uh, imply simple um, heredity. Uh, people could become courtiers uh, who were not of uh, of noble birth. So that's that was sort of a feature of the Renaissance schools as well. So either you needed, we could say, either you needed birth, or you needed talent. <laughs> uh, that was, those were sort of the limiting uh, conditions we could say of these schools. Uh, now, one of the figures who went through these these schools that were very important that was very important to this whole development was Federigo de Montefeltre. I think he so he's in the middle of the 15th uh, century. Uh, so he converts his small town uh, into one of the greatest uh, cultural centers of Europe, uh, which uh, sort of uh, define a lot of the. Uh, the taste, uh, we could say, of the met uh, of of the period, and was really a kind of um, ideal. You could say his court, his ducal palace, which he built, was really a, a kind of ideal. So, uh, again, in this book on the uh, Italian uh, Renaissance, uh, he says, as a result of Castiglione's much translated book of the courtier, people all over the Western world heard of this remote mountain town and learned from the standard of Urbino a code of manners, a way of courtesy that became the norm of polite behavior. And people were coming from all over uh, Europe, right? I mean, you had painters coming from Spain. Uh, he was a patron of the arts, so Raphael came. He built a gigantic library, right? Which uh, was uh, very interesting uh, for scholars. Um, the Ducal Palace itself is, is considered a, a kind of masterpiece. You could see it featured in Civilization, in Kenneth Clark's Civilization. And, but the manners of his court, uh, because of Castiglione, who, who served the Montefeltres, right, um, uh, became kind of, we could say, the Camelot for the, for the gentlemanly uh, ideal in some sense. Uh, so I was next going to turn to Castiglione itself, but I thought maybe I'll pause there and see if you had any, any thoughts or questions there, Moritz. No, I think at this point it'd be interesting to hear about how, uh, the sort of thought leaders of this movement, uh, cast and shaped it. Yeah. So we see here, right, that this idea of the court, uh, 
uh, becomes very important. And again, I think that one of the reasons for this is that uh, most of Europe was still ruled by courts, right? And it became one of the most uh, transmissible elements of the Italian Renaissance because the strictly urban stuff until Europe urbanizes a bit more, the more the more uh, uh, urban elements become harder to to transmit the more urban bound elements. But the idea of the courtier uh, sort of catches fire. So the, so like I said, he was a diplomat. He served in Urbino and lived at the court there uh, under F Federigo and uh, his son Gu Gu Guidibaldo, right? Who was the figure in uh, in Il Cortegiano in the um, in the uh, the courtier, right? Uh, so it is dates are fourteen seventy eight to fifteen twenty eight. This book becomes a to call it a bestseller would be a gross understatement, right? So between 1528 and 1616, it goes through 108 editions, right? <laughs> it's translated into Spanish, French, German, Polish, uh, and English, right? It's one of the elements in Shakespeare, right? In his depiction of court life in his uh, plays. Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Prince Charles, they said he, had, he kept three books with him at his side. The Bible, Machiavelli's The Prince, and Castiglione's The Courtier. <laughs> um, and uh, right, so it gets like Thomas Hobby translates it into English, uh, as, uh, and, he, and in his introduction to it, he says, uh, so that both he, that is uh, Castiglione, shall get him the reputation now here in England, which he hath a good while since beyond the sea in Italy, Spain, and France. And I shall think my small travail well employed and sufficiently recompensed. Uh, he goes on to call it to ladies and gentle, he says, to, he says, generally ought this to be an estimation with all degrees of men, for to princes and great men it is a rule to themselves that rule others, to young gentlemen and encouraging, and encouraging to garnish their mind with moral virtues and their body with comely exercises, and both the one and the other with honest qualities to attain their noble ends. And he goes on to say, and to them all in general, a storehouse of most necessary implements for the conversation, use, and training up of man's life with courtly uh, demeanors, right? Uh, so it's a hit, right? <laughs> all across all across Europe, right? France, Spain, uh, uh, England, right? It gets translated and, uh, and transmitted. What is the Cortesiano about, right? So he's basically depicting a discussion um apparently what they did was they would have sort of games where they uh pick a topic for discussion uh and uh the people at court then argue the case and uh and build up the dialogue so in a way it's a little bit like a platonic dialogue right and so before the duchess elizabetta gonzaga and it's worth noting this is another important aspect of the renaissance the the, the important role of women in this Renaissance uh, court world, uh, they the, so they're going to pick as the discussion what does it mean to be a perfect courtier, right? Meaning the people who would serve uh, at court, and so um, the figures in this discussion uh, start uh, debating the point, right? What does it mean to be a, a great courtier? Uh, so Count Ludovico, right, he's defending the older view that essentially the courtier is someone gifted in arms, right? The courtier is someone who is a skilled uh, warrior, right? And that's the, that's the essential thing uh, which is needed. Now Pietro Bembo, right, who is an important Renaissance figure, a papal secretary, uh, he argues against it saying, that letters are even more important than arms. And the example he says is that if Alexander envied Achilles, not for his deeds, but for the fortune that had granted him the happiness of explaining his exploits celebrated by Homer, we may conclude that Alexander esteemed Homer's poems above Achilles's arms. For what other judge do, we, do you wait then, or for what other sentence upon the dignity of arms and letters than that pronounced by one of the greatest commanders that have ever been seen, right? Because he's discussing the scene when uh, Alexander um, 
praises, goes to the tomb of Achilles, praises Achilles, and and speaks about how happy he was to have Homer celebrate his work, his work, his works, and give him an everlasting uh, name. Right. So this is the argument for the supremacy of letters. The argument is that the courtier, first of all, they kind of agree. The courtier needs to be a master of arms and of all of the uh, sort of sports and athleticism that is necessary also to be a good warrior, right? Skilled in equestrianism and in, uh, you know, uh, running and right, all, all the various uh, um, uh, physical activities. Uh, but in addition to this, um, the courtier also needs to be a person of letters, right? To know Greek and Latin and the modern uh, languages, uh, to know something of poetry and music and painting. Uh, and yet we could say to bear all this with uh, what was called spezzatura, uh, which meant kind of a, um, a nonchalance, we could say. Um, so in so so a, a one of the figures in the dialogue says accordingly we may affirm that to be true art which does not that to be true art which does not appear to be art nor to anything must must we give greater care than to conceal art so this is sort of what they saw as the essence of grace in, in the renaissance was to make things appear to be effortless, right? I think, you know, uh, although that's often seen as affectation, if not even a bit of social deceit, uh, the, the, we still sense that today where we have the expression in English, right? They made it look easy, right? When you have like an athlete, an athlete achieves some great feat, uh, but makes it look easy, we're particularly impressed, right? Uh, so I think that that is kind of the, the, um, discussion. Now they have also this discussion about is, uh, so, so we see this universal man idea, right? Skilled in poetry, skilled in music, not knowing Greek and Latin, a good sportsman and equestrian, uh, knowledgeable in music, uh, right? Um, you know, all these things and, and uh, skilled in arms. Uh, and so we have uh, also, this discussion that I sort of briefly mentioned about how important is lineage or heredity in this, right? So one of the figures, Paolo Vicino, says, well, there are plenty of people that have high, are of high birth with no virtue, uh, and um, plenty of people who, who don't have uh, high birth who are very virtuous. So why is it important to, you know, so, so it's not important. Uh, Ludovico, Count Ludovico, argues that uh, it's an extra spur because of the shame that one could dishonor one's ancestors and so forth. So they have this kind of debate. But here again, we have this notion of vera nobilitate, right? The, could, uh, the idea is they pretty much agree that one can acquire, let's say, gentlemanliness, uh, regardless of birth, uh, through education and manners, again. And a final thing important to mention is uh, the importance of women in all this, right? There's also a lady ideal. Uh, which is in uh, Castiglione, uh, and there's a lot of discussion of gallant behavior and this things. I think even to this day, we still have that idea, right? He was a perfect gentleman, let's say on a date or something, right? <laughs> Means somebody that acts gallantly towards uh, women. So, so uh, that's actually something which is a little different than what you see in the Greeks, where women are rarely a major presence. So it's an important element in the Renaissance. Uh, I'll turn in a moment to manners, but uh, I think I'll pause there. Miles, did you have any thoughts? Um, just uh, perhaps to, to underscore um, this idea of the two-way relationship between uh, social circumstances and makings of the gentleman, and maybe the role of the gentleman in contributing to society, right? Because I, you know, I get this idea from the at least the the emerging or nascent classlessness of the ideal, meaning that it, it's something that transcends, uh, say, noble origin or or uh, social rank. Um, there is an idea of virtue over fortune, that that this for, formulation of character can uh, go beyond station and birth, for example, and circumstance, um, but also that I guess it, it can help master 
vicissitudes or uncertainties of life. So um, is there anything at this point you would want to say to help round out the picture of the gentleman in terms of how not just making their own character in this rounded and universal way you've talked about, there's also an idea that um, this kind of person helps make for a better and more conversant and more peaceful or civilized society. Is, is that is that an important, I mean, it, it seems implicitly to be important, but is, is that a theme for these, uh, for people like Castiglione? Uh, well, yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I should, I, I don't want to depict it as literally classless because predominantly this ideal, we could say most affected the, the aristocracy, but it was also possible as we see with the Renaissance court schools for persons of talent to enter into this sort of world of the, of the, of the, of the courtier. Uh, now in terms of social utility. Okay. So remember I talked about the rhetor is the person who persuades within the Republic, right? Let's say the Florentine Republic. So who is the person who persuades the King, right? And leads the King toward virtue. It's the courtier according to Castiglione. So that's one element, right? Uh, in other words, the person who ha who is charismatic, beautiful, virtuous, etc., beautiful in their deeds and actions, uh, and graceful, uh, is the person who's likely to be best positioned to influence uh, policy and to lead, let's say, the kings and princes uh, toward uh, virtuous uh, activities. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, I think that you you also see. Uh, the development of the aristocracy as a patronage class, right? So if you look at uh, who, um, if you look at who was behind, let's say Shakespeare, or um, you look at the Medici's and the Pazzi's, uh, you know, sponsoring the various arts and sort of this uh, competition and this sort of thing, uh, it was clearly the idea that the gentleman makes themselves useful by uh, by the promotion, let's say, of cultural ideals within um, the society, and uh, of course, manners themselves, uh, and uh, you know, are an expression of social virtue, right? So, so the fact that uh, simply by modeling uh, manners and giving be, being an exemplar of them, uh, there's also an idea, I think, that one um, has an impact on this society. So, does that uh, does that help at all? It, it does, and I guess for those who are interested in this theme, it really also points to our course on rhetoric. So that's another, that's one of the ones we're running this fall. And that idea about uh, the making of a, an integral, well-rounded self and uh, the making of, of civic virtue being hand in hand is something we explore at great length. So for, for people who find that uh, resonant or intriguing, uh, they might want to look at that uh, rhetoric course. Yeah, uh, and, and um, you know, the other thing I mentioned, uh, it is also true, besides what I just noted during the period of the Renaissance, that in later periods, let's say the 18th and 19th century, like if you had gone to uh, Victorian England, right, uh, the bourgeois classes and so forth felt that their ticket, let's say, uh, to entrance into high society would be, for example, sending their children to what were called public schools, but were in fact independent private schools. Uh, where they would learn the classics, where they would learn manners and so forth, right, and become yeah. integrated. So there was, we could say, we could call it a kind of trickle down in some sense, right? I mean, there's a sense in which these ideals became more and more extended as social changes swept across uh, the, the, the continent. Uh, now, the last figure that I wanted to discuss was Giovanni della Casa, who wrote this uh, also very influential uh, book, um, he had uh, uh, called the per called um, Il Galateo, right? Which is again about the idea of the gentleman, but giving more rules for uh, manners. Uh, so it's the ancestor, let's say, of the modern etiquette book. Uh, and he says that. Um, the, uh, so so the first thing again to mention is that there is this idea of. The importance of the social virtues. Why are manners important? Because they're sort of what is required to live together with other human beings in a stable and mutually convenient, satisfying way. Uh, so um, he, he says, uh, this is written about the middle of the 16th century, he says, there is no doubt, but whoso disposes himself to live not in solitary and desert places as hermits, but in fellowship with men and in populous cities,
will think it a very necessary thing to have skill to put himself forth calmly and seemly in his fashions, gestures, and manners, right? Uh, so if you don't want to be a hermit, right, <laughs> the idea is that manners are of, cent are of central importance, right? Not to give offense to one's fellows. Now, if we did a longer course, we could discuss a lot more of the particulars, but I think I would just want to go over uh, some of the principles of, of manners, right? Uh, many people think of manners in terms of like table manners and things like that. He gives much more emphasis on conversation, being classically educated himself, talks a lot about rhetoric and so forth. Uh, and so he says, we, um, the, so what are some of the principles? One is anything which offends the senses of our fellows is bad. Uh, we say then that every act that offends any of the common senses or over thwarts a man's will and desire or else presents to the imagination and conceit matters unpleasant, right? Um, so anything which brings to the mind or to the imagination things which others find unpleasant it, uh, goes against manners. One of those would seem to be anything connected with the functions of the body. So this was one I liked. He says, and when you have blown your nose, use not to open your handkerchief as if you had pearls and rubies fallen from your brains. But these be slovenly parts, enough to cause men not so much uh, not to love us as if they did love us, to unlove us again, right? So that would be an example, right? Uh, things which exude from the body are generally viewed by fellow men as disgusting and therefore are to be avoided. And we're to avo avoid not only doing any such function in the presence of others, uh, but even to bring to the mind of others such things. So that would be that would be uh, one of them. Uh, now, one of the uh, now now so another thing would be anything which offends the pride of our fellows, right? So first is the senses. Another would be the pr uh, pride. Uh, so among examples he gives is, for example, when you interrupt somebody or if you are self-occupied, right? So for example, he says, even being sort of morose in a so social circumstances or just being occupied in your own thoughts while people are talking to you, you're giving a slight, right? You know, because if you're interrupting them, it's like saying that what they're saying is not important compared to what you're saying. And if you uh, are, you know, your eyes are turned away and you're thinking about thinking about or doing other things. It's probably especially common now with iPads and all this sort of, uh, that's also making light, right? You're sort of slighting your fellow. Uh, another aspect would be boastfulness, right? So it says, neither must a man boast of his nobility, his honor or riches, much less vaunt of his wit or gloriously rehearse too much of his deeds and valiant acts or what his ancestors have done, right? So what is the reason why this is so bad? <laughs> uh, boasting about yourself. Well, so he says that this can only have one of two effects in a social situation. If you start, like you, you're in a social situation, you start talking about how great and rich and, uh, and uh, a what a genius you are and stuff like that. This can only have one of two, can have serve of one of two things. If they're people who feel themselves to be your equal, it's as if you're challenging them, right? And so that sets up a uh, that sets up a conflictual situation. And if they feel themselves to be below you, like you're bragging like that, say to servants or something like that, uh, then you are humiliating them. So all of this is is uh, any kind of boastfulness is considered very. Uh, bad uh, uh, manners, right? Uh, hurting people's self self image and self esteem. Uh, constantly contradicting people in a social situation. You know, you're at a dinner, and every time someone expresses an opinion, you tell them why they're wrong, uh, and this and this uh, sort of thing. So, yeah. So that probably gives us a little bit of a sense, right? Um, you know. Uh, 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 of, of what this means. Now, the very fact that he had to tell people that opening up your handkerchief and gazing upon what you just put in it 
Uh, the very fact that he tell people that probably gives you an, an idea of what manners were likely like before <laughs> before the Renaissance. Uh, he, you know, he gives various examples like that, talking so close to somebody that your breath is in their face. Uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, 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 he gives he gives a lot of this sort of thing. The book is is supposed to be sort of the curmudgeonly advice of an old man to his nephew, and it sometimes comes across a little bit about that. But he gives lots of rules of uh, of manners, and uh, most of them I would say are still uh, applicable to this day, right? I mean, so again, it's sort of the ancestor. He says, for example, not to discuss things which are vain, vulgar, or filthy, right? Uh, so attacking uh, religion, discussing body functions, uh, being uh, generally vulgar. Uh, he warns also about vanity, right? Uh, going on and on about things which are foolish and frivolous <laughs> and these sorts of things. He talks about dress and moderation of, in dress, right? Not to be too flamboyant or uh, too slovenly. Right, let's say there's a sense in which if your dress is slovenly uh, that, that, that you're not taking cons, uh, cons, sufficient consideration of your of your fellows as well. So there's a great, great uh, influence. Uh, there's a great e emphasis here on sort of the social virtues and not giving offense. So does that help at all? It, it does. And, I, you know, by way of by way of closing, uh, perhaps, uh, Alex, one thing. Uh, I pick up from what you're talking about is um, the prevalence of certain um, motherhood rules in our society, which we sort of think of as being fixtures of civilization, but but actually were codified uh, starting with some of these pivotal in the Renaissance uh, courtier setting, uh, and also the ongoing relevance of that kind of tradition through through revival periods at some historical remove. So, for example, you mentioned briefly. One period in which the manner-focused um, culture perhaps resembles this this uh, you know original Renaissance form is you know Victorian society with the you know untold number of of manuals on manners for men and women and uh, you know the kind of broadening of standards you mentioned the schools to which people of you know comparably lower station or fortune uh, might send their children to, to sort of um, earn a stake in society through uh, gentlemanly perfection, as it were. So, you know, did you have any thoughts about um, the uh, fading of those um, today and the makings of, you know, yet another revival? The reason I ask is I notice things like on the subways, you'll see uh, public campaigns to remind people of, of basic conduct, like not putting their, their boots up on the seats and things like that, and making room for people who are frail. And whatnot. So, you know, in, in terms of the ongoing relevance, both the, you know a revival interest or the fading of manners, I mean, what are some of the drivers or impedances that, that might be interesting? Um, yeah. Well, I guess one the well, first question is say why why did they fade? Right. I mean, they they've never been gone uh, entirely. You can Google finishing schools today, and you can still find uh, find these things. Uh, not not to mention. Well, etiquette guides would be one uh, that's about manners, but also uh, in a lot of different kinds of schools, you know, private schools in the U.S. and the British public schools are still around, what were called public schools, uh, but were actually uh, private schools and the gymnasia in Germany and the Italian Lycee. There's still a lot of legacy uh, of classical education, uh, which is uh, still uh, going on. One of the interesting questions, and I don't, I don't have necessarily the canonical answers. Why, why was there this sort of decline of the gentlemanly ideal? I think that there's a few reasons. Uh, one is World War One, I, I think, <laughs> uh, which destroyed pretty much uh, most of the court culture in Europe that remained. Uh, and in any event, there was kind of a, a kind of realist reaction against what they saw as the affect the affectation and insincerity, let's say, of that kind of existence, right? Of that type, of, the, of that sort of, those sort of courtly um, models. There was probably some stigma uh, related to what it was, it was seen as we saw it, it sort of began to some degree, though not completely, uh, 
as sort of uh, 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 related to class and sort of in the anti-elitist uh, movements, um, there was kind of um, a, a sense of negativity about uh, that sort of thing, right? So uh, speaking with a Queen's English and these sort of things, is, has, you know, there's a lot of crit crit critique of that as sort of a class-based um, ideal. Um, yeah, that's a lot of things. I mean, that, the, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't have the canonical answer for why there's been this sort of um, a, a decline. Did, did you have any thoughts on it yourself? No, it, it really is an open question because I, I the reason I ask it is just to, to touch on the topical um, interest that I think is, is out there because on the one hand, I think the ideal is always an ideal, meaning it's 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 seldom fully achieved. And I you know the the the, the guidance uh, that you quoted from some of these early texts by Castiglione and others suggest that you know he's talking about manners um, up to which uh, his contemporaries do not fully live. So you know there's an abiding sense of the ideal of you know always wanting in effect a better, uh, a more genteel, uh, you know a, a nobler conduct in oneself and in others. Um, and, and also just, uh, the, the, it's purely a hunch on my part that, that uh, some of the interest that, that we see in, in the things we mentioned at the start of this, of this video um, comes from a sense of anxiety about loss of guideposts. In other words, that social situations are complicated and in the absence of uh, refined manners or even agreed manners, there is a feeling of it being more um, mentally and, and uh, personally taxing to navigate them when you don't know how to uh, signal in an ele elegant way that you understand someone or that you wish something to be understood. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always wondering, uh, as I see these things in, in, in our society, uh, what the availability or viability of some of these classical reference points are. And anyway, we'd like to hear uh, in feedback, uh, what, what people would like to see in the course and, and please let us know about your interest in this. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I think you see in the culture today, right? I mean, there's a lot of this, a lot of fear and concern about the loss of coarseness. I mean, sorry, the growing coarseness and lack of civility in the society, the inability of people to talk to each other, <laughs> uh, in a, in, in, in a civil, uh, manner. Um, you saw that concern even expressed by Burke, right? who saw, I mean, he emphasized actually the decline of manners as the roots of the chaos, which he saw de developing in his in his own time, right? Uh, that society was literally, without these social virtues, society literally starts to break uh, apart. Um, so I think that, yeah, it, it would not be surprising to me at all if uh, having gone through the phase of sort of a cynical critique of manners as this uh, as a sort of affectation uh, which was dominant through much of the 20th century uh, we eventually cycle back and because the core of it um, is about education and manners it's something which is potentially um, uh, can be acquired right uh, not uh, and so and so that I think in itself creates a certain amount of interest so does that uh so i think we probably probably covered what the topic is and let us know in your comments if it's uh something that would be of interest uh, to you to discuss uh more and okay. and once again meanwhile if there's interest in the three courses we mentioned the nietzsche and socrates uh virtues in classical philosophy and rhetoric uh please contact you is that not the case absolutely yes and and my email is on this video take Excellent. care everyone. till See next you. time